Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Today I will give the sermon, a brief prayer, and a blessing. But let us begin with the prayer for the Spirit of God to work amongst us as we hear his word. Lord our God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to hear and understand your word. And we pray that your spirit will work amongst us as we listen and learn what your will for our lives is this day. Please guide us in the way we should go and how we should live our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. passage for today comes from John chapter 12 verses 17 through 33 and I encourage you all to look up the passage as we uh, go over our past sermons in the series but as many of you probably remember this is the third sermon in the series of the serpent in Christ in all the symbolism of the serpent that is the devil and Christ show up a total of seven times throughout the scripture in the first sermon, we explored the very first prophecy of Christ when God said to the serpent that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent will strike his heel. In last week's sermon, that is the second sermon in the series, we saw the real life manifestation of the predicament of that prophecy, that is the serpent striking the heels of the descendants of God's people we are in that story we found that we the people of God were ungrateful that no not one of us sought the Lord but instead complained about the manna from heaven and the faithfulness of God and all this happened immediately after the Israelites passed by the Red Sea where they were reminded of God's awesome victory over the Egyptian army what we saw was the symbol of sin, that is, the serpent made of fire, biting and poisoning the Israelites. The serpent symbolizes both the fires of hell, since it was made of fire, and also the poisoning of sin that we are struck with, hopelessly contaminated with, as descendants of Adam and Eve. And therefore, we have to look up to the fiery serpent, Christ, that became sin for us. We have to look up to him on the cross in order to live and this brothers and sisters are not just my words but the very words of Jesus in John chapter 3 he says just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life and so last week we explored the second and third time as I mentioned before that the symbol of the serpent in Christ are named in scripture and now we will explore the fourth time that this symbol appears and we find it in John chapter 12 beginning in verse 17 all the way through 33 and it says the following now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks amongst those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. <coughs> Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life, who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal <coughs> life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my 
servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. <coughs> now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> of all the customer appeal and customer satisfaction businesses, the one industry that many experts argue contr has contributed the most is the fast food industry. For example, in order to get more people buying more hamburgers, fast food chains started adding sugar to their buns, to their bread. They started adding after that sugar to their condiments like ketchup and may mayonnaise. They didn't care about the calorie counts or the health of their customers as much as they cared about meeting their tastes and gaining larger sales. In fact, in one study, we found I found that the largest fast food chain in the world went so far as changing their chemical composition of their artificial cheese on their cheeseburgers. They changed it according to their study where they would feed children these cheeseburgers and while they were in an MRI machine they would see how closely the child's brain would resemble the reaction of a drug addict's brain on drugs and they would change or tweak the recipe of the artificial food in order to best match that response. For the fast food industry, taste and sales are everything to the point of where every major fast food chain has at one point in the last 10 years, or still does, it still serves FDA permissible quantity of carcinogens in some of their foods. Brothers and sisters, it's all about making their food more palatable and popular, even if morality or safety is sacrificed. And likewise, brothers and sisters, churches, whole denominations can become all about making Christianity more palatable and popular, all in the name of drawing all men to Christ, all in the name of getting as many people in their front door as possible. But is this really, dear friends, how we are to exalt Christ? There is no denying that these consumer-oriented methods of megachurches are effective. But what is it exactly that Christ would have us do in order to, quote-unquote, draw all men to me? Well, let us first begin with the larger historical context in order to understand what Jesus is doing and what it means to us. And we will actually find this context out of our first three verses, that is 17 through 19, for it states, Now the crowd that was with him, when he had called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. It would be good for us to note, dear friends, that in the Gospel of John, when he uses the term whole world, it is a very intentional use, going all the way back to John chapter 3. For God so loved the whole world, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. Now what we have to understand is that if there is an entity 
that represents popular opinion or making the Jewish faith more palatable, it is the Pharisees. Why? Because as Jesus says, they stood on street corners saying prayers in order to gain the praises of men. They gave their tithing with the blowing of trumpets. They also sought out audiences with the Roman rulers of their district. They often said such things as we have no king but Caesar, all in the name of being more popular and palatable. If there was anyone who was an entity that was a master of this practice, it was the Pharisees. And this, dear friends, is the main historical context of our text, what is relevant to us and how it applies to us. However, what we also find in these past three verses that we just read is a play on words in the Greek. For you see, Jesus in John chapter 3 talked about how Moses raised the serpent and how the Son of Man also had to be raised. And then in verse 17, when the Greek verb raised is used for Lazarus, we, see, we find that the champions of popularity, that is the Pharisees, can't compete with Jesus because they say, look how the whole world has gone after him. And this is our first major point in the outline, that in Jesus raising up Lazarus, the whole world was already being drawn to him. In Jesus raising up Lazarus, the whole world was already being drawn to him. This was a foreshadowing of the effectiveness of the cross, of the effectiveness of the gospel with God's son dying and crushing the head of the serpent. This is the main first point, that in Jesus raising up Lazarus, that play in Greek words, the whole world was already being drawn to him. And this is immediately supported by the verses that follow, verses 20 through 23. Now there were some Greeks amongst those who <coughs> went up to work <coughs> at the festival, at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man <coughs> to be glorified. In other words, brothers and sisters, the unheard of reaction was that of large masses of Greeks, not Jews, but Greeks, asking to see Jesus. This kind of popular reaction, this kind of religious draw was unheard of for the Jews, and it testified to how powerful, how effective the act of quote-unquote raising up is and to this reaction Jesus immediately says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified and then Jesus goes on with what I would describe as a distasteful unpalatable metaphor for glorification now hear me out on this verses 24 through 25 says I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And, and so many of those listening may not get why these verses are so unpalatable, because we've grown up our whole lives hearing them in church but if Jesus is talking about the resurrection or the crucifixion and I believe he is it would be comparable to someone saying in today's terms that Christ's glorification is in his execution in him being strapped down to the electric chair him being pulsated through with electricity crying out from the torturous pain and then dying a horrible criminal's death where his body is cooked can you see brothers and sisters why this would strike in jesus's day 
and even in our day as unpalatable and unpopular. Why? Because people had seen crucifixions many times and they were disgusting and they were terribly difficult to watch. Can you see why, dear brothers and sisters, so many megachurches try and play down the death aspect, the hell aspect, and instead try to play up the love aspect of the gospel? But brothers and sisters, if we were to do this, it would be an incredibly large mistake, for we must lift up Jesus just as he is. And that's our second main point in the outline. We must lift up Jesus just as he is. In other words, Jesus doesn't need you to make excuses on his behalf. Jesus doesn't need you to rewrite or hide certain aspects of the gospel in order to draw all men to him. Why? Because the gospel is a supernatural phenomenon that does not depend on human efforts to survive. It may be foolishness to the Greeks, it may be a stumbling block to the Jews, but it nevertheless gains followers that are so devoted that they are willing to give their entire lives, yes, even their current life in death in the name of the gospel. Now, if we skip to verses 31 through 33, this is where we find the metaphor for the serpent and Christ. It says, now is the time for judgment on this world. <coughs> the prince of darkness, the prince of this world, will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. In other words, brothers and sisters, the prince of this world is the serpent, the devil. And Jesus is saying that once he is lifted up on the cross, that is lifted up on a ghastly, inhumane, repulsive form of execution, that that would draw all men to him. But you have to understand, dear brothers and sisters, that the popular, palatable way to draw all men to you would have instead been, according to the Roman Empire, a glorious march of victory into the city or state or empire capital. It would be Jesus riding in on chariots of fire with an army of intimidating warring angels and all his opposing nations being trampled under his feet, kissing unto his feet, not with Jesus being executed as a criminal. How could that possibly glorify him? And this, brothers and sisters, is the main point at least one of the very major points in the Gospel of John when it comes to Jesus' kingship, when it comes to Jesus' godhood, that he is glorified, that he draws all nations to him when he is exalted according to his own terms. Yes, the terms of death on the cross. And this, dear friends, leads us to our third and final point in the sermon outline that is how this applies to us to being his disciples and i shall read verse 26 which states whoever serves me must follow me and where i am my servant also will be my father will honor the one who serves me and what we must understand is that this verse dear friends is in the context immediately after when Jesus says a grain of wheat must fall and die. In other words, it is in the context of imitating Christ and walking according to his standards. In other words, don't rewrite the gospel in order to make it more popular and palatable. Don't sugarcoat it in order to get more people in the front door, but simply follow after Jesus just as he is. And that's the third and final point in our outline. We must follow after Jesus just as he is we must follow after jesus just as he is that is how brothers and sisters we shall truly draw all men to him therefore dear friends remember that the gospel is nothing to be ashamed of 
For even when Jesus raised up Lazarus, the whole world was already starting to be drawn to him. How much more when they realized the power of his own hand raising himself up from the dead unto immortality. Therefore, dear friends, remember that we must lift up Jesus just as he is. For although the gospel may seem at times unpalatable, politically incorrect to society, ultimately it is, as scripture says, living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. (coughs) It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Therefore, dear friends, (coughs) remember that we must follow after Jesus just as he is. Let us conclude, dear friends, with the reading of Romans chapter 1, verse 16, which states the truth that I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Dear friends, let us not be ashamed of the gospel. Let us not seek to make it palatable or popular, but instead let us lift up the Son of Man as he is meant to be exalted, and that way he shall draw all men to him. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the wisdom we find here in this text, and we pray, O Lord, that we will understand and see the value of not compromising on the gospel. And we pray, O Lord, that you will please bless us with a heart of dedication so that we know that even though we may not have a great quantity of people walking through our front door as some of those customer oriented churches that at least lord we are faithful and if we lift you up the way you are intended to be lifted up that is how you shall truly draw all men of all nations to you lord help us to understand and live these principles out in our life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. (coughs) Let us now say (coughs) a quick prayer for the people of God. Lord, we thank you because so many people in our congregation have been sick and yet now have recovered, have come home from the hospital. And Lord, those who are perhaps still sick, those who are still recovering, grant them your grace and your strength. And Lord, we pray that the church, even though it has not been able to gather these past few weeks, shall remain faithful in its heart and seek to follow after you in all things. Lord, for these needs and the many more that have gone unforgotten, have gone forgotten or unspoken, show us your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you his peace. Amen.